From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Could the coming school year be a turning point for school choice? Plus, Donald Trump strongly signals that he will skip the Republican presidential debate next week as a super PAC aligned with Ron DeSantis says the governor's strategy should be to defend Trump. Welcome. I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleague, columnist Bill McGurn. Happy Friday to you, Bill. As American families head back into classrooms in coming weeks, if they're not there already, some of those kids are going to new classrooms. The Journal had an editorial recently on the rising demand for school choice programs. Here are a couple of the figures. Indiana is saying that its voucher program is experiencing an increase of about 20%. One of the scholarship organizations in Florida that gives out K-12 scholarships, it's called Step Up for Students has said it's awarded about 270,000 income-based scholarships this year, up from about 183,000 the same time a year ago. And then there was a, a New York Times story recently about the new universal education savings account system in Arizona. And since launching last September, this report says, it has gone from about 12,000 students to about 60,000, and officials are estimating it could hit 100,000 next summer. Those are some remarkable statistics of growth in these school voucher programs. And as a reminder to people, the first private school choice program in the country was passed in Milwaukee in 1990. So to many conservatives who wonder what they've conserved, what the movement the Republican Party has been doing in these past three decades, what it's won, I think that is a real good answer. These school choice programs seem to be proliferating, particularly in the years since the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, I say the short answer is that the unions brought it on themselves. Before COVID, we had almost no universal school choice where every child in the state had some eligibility for a voucher. Now it's up to, I think, nine. Probably by early next year, we'll have 12 states that pre-COVID didn't have these universal choice programs, but now have it. I think the teachers' unions won the battle. You know, they were managed to keep the schools closed during COVID when parents wanted them open. Sometimes even the city officials wanted them open, like in San Francisco, and the teachers' unions fought it. But I think they're losing the war because people saw with that that in the public schools, traditional public schools, The students don't come first. The teachers' unions come first. And they want out, and they're getting out. They may be losing the war, but the continuing battles you can see in the news. And a recent one, Bill, you've looked at this study that discusses the funding for traditional government public schools versus charter schools, which are often non-union. And what does this study say about the gap in the funding to those two different kinds of public schools? Well, the study is done by Pat Wolf, a professor at the University of Arkansas. He's been looking at funding for charters since 2002. And he's found that despite all the changes, the number of charter students increasing, the number of public school students decreasing enrollment, changes in performance, the gap has been roughly about a third, 30% since 2002. And that's remained, it's on a per pupil basis, that's remained remarkably constant. And so what it says is that our system is not allied to the current realities of public education. People want choice, especially charters, and the funding hasn't caught up. It still goes disproportionately to the district schools. And the question, as charter schools continue to be shown to be successful, is why that gap persists. On the one hand, maybe the lower cost of these charter schools is one of the things that allowed them to get in the door, particularly in states that have strong teachers' union presences, is state legislatures could be told, listen, we're going to set up a charter school and it will eventually cost the state less per student than this traditional public school. But Bill, why would state legislatures continue to buy that kind of logic as many parents are choosing charters, as they continue to grow, and as they continue to be shown to be successful compared with those traditional public schools? I mean, is this a moment maybe 
that advocates should go to those state legislatures and say, why don't we close that gap? And we see charters being successful. Why not try to multiply that by giving them the same amount of money that is going to the regular government schools? You make a common sense point. Why not reward the schools that are doing their jobs? You know, in June, Stanford had a report from the Center for Research on education outcomes, and they found that, quote, most charters produce superior student gains despite enrolling a more challenging student population. That's a bombshell report because the same report, like 20 years ago, found no difference between charters and traditional public schools. And that was used by charter enemies for years, saying they're not the answer. But now they have a proven track record of success. And common sense would say you reward what's successful and not what's unsuccessful. But again, the funding is part of politics and the teachers unions are very powerful, especially in our cities, which are controlled by Democrats. This is a big part of the Democratic Party. So the kids come second. Another continuing battle, at least in New York, regarding charter schools are the issues of co-location and where those schools go, where they can get space in existing school buildings, whether in use or not, or other public property. And Bill, there was an interesting result there in New York a week ago where a Manhattan judge ruled in a case about two Success Academy charter schools that were on the verge of opening. What is the story there? Can you tell us about that lawsuit and what the judge ultimately did? In New York City, a lot of public schools are co-located, which means there could be a middle school in with a high school or a special ed school. They're in the same building. The city publishes a list of buildings with vacant space. So if Kyle wanted to start the Kyle Peterson Charter, the fastest way to get it up and running is to take space that is available. And often it is space co-located with other public schools. Again, in New York, this is not uncommon. Many ordinary public schools are co-located with other public schools. But the teachers unions hate it. When charters get a co-located school, I think they hate it, one, because of the contrast, and two, they know that this enables them to get up and running fast. What they were hoping to do, they sued on the basis of a new law in New York that says public schools have to reduce class size. And they said that when the city awarded the space to Success Academy, they didn't really take into account sufficiently the class size law. If the judge had allowed that, that would have been a huge precedent. They would use that basically to thwart co-locations. Fortunately, he ruled against it. But it tells you again of the union priorities that five days before the charters were supposed to open, the union sought a restraining order to prevent them from doing it, saying that they were creating problems on the grounds and so forth. The kind of complaints were that charter workers were stealing candy from the other schools. Again, fortunately, the judge junked that. But it shows you the teachers unions didn't care if they closed the charters and threw 500 kids' futures into limbo. But it's mysterious to me, the legal merits of that case aside, why this is not a bigger political story, why there is not more outcry about this. That's not just the the kids at those two charter schools, but their parents. You'd think that 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 would be a sympathetic story And you get somebody like Mayor Eric Adams on the record about whether this co-location makes sense or what his objection to it is. And for that matter, what about New York Governor Kathy Hochul? My recollection, Bill, is that when she was campaigning for the governorship, she was campaigning as someone who was friendly to charter schools, who said they're doing a good job educating students in these schools, again, particularly Success Academy, and we need to expand them, maybe lift that cap on charter schools. And am I wrong, or has she backed off that, soft pedaled that a little bit after being elected and going to Albany? She has backed off, and uh, Mayor Eric Adams has also backed off. They don't fight. The charter schools are harassed every day by the unions. They sue, I think, Success Academy probably the best charter chain in the nation, has been sued, 
I think a dozen times by the UFT. It's a campaign of harassment. Say this for Andrew Cuomo. He came through for charters in the clutch a lot of times. I don't see any of the political leaders standing up for them now. I think they're too afraid of the influence and power of the teachers unions within the Democratic Party.